Welcome to the Period Story Podcast, the podcast where we get behind some of the myths and misconceptions about periods. We chat with women about their period story, their first period, their journey ever since, and we open up a conversation to help break taboos and stigmas around menstruation. I'm your host, Denise Brothers. I'm a yoga teacher and registered nutritionist specializing in women's health, hormones, and the menstrual cycle. I'm also the author of You Can Have a Better Period, the book Publishers Weekly calls an empowering debut, an informative, refreshing take on women's health. It's available from Amazon, Bookshop, and anywhere else you purchase books. I'm so excited for you to hear today's episode. I have a great conversation with Lorraine Candy, who is an award-winning journalist, editor, and a best-selling author. We talk about perimenopause, perimenopausal rage, changing identity, and of course we talk about her new book, What's Wrong With Me? 101 Things Midlife Women Need to Know, which is available for pre-order now. Hi, Lorraine. Thank you so much for coming on to the show today. Let's get started with a question I ask all my guests, which is tell me the story of your very first period. Well, we have to go back in time 43 years ago for that because I'm 54 (laughs) now. So I started my periods when I was 11, which actually was, um, I think, quite young. Uh, So it would have been in the 80s, early 80s. Um, But it was, I think, when I look back, I knew absolutely nothing about it. It wasn't talked about at school. Uh, My mum was very old fashioned and very traditional. She didn't really talk about it at home. She found it quite embarrassing. I have a sister as well, a younger sister. Um, And I remember at the time being absolutely terrified because I really didn't physically know how I was going to deal with it. You know, I was going to have to ask my mum to buy um, sanitary pads. And she, she, when I told her, she Bless her. She said, I, well, it can't be. You're only 11. I, I don't really believe you. it'll be something else. And then nothing else was said. So I was in a sort of strange place of I didn't really know what to do. So a friend's uh, mum had uh, given her some sanitary t- pads at school. And I talked to her and I borrowed them. And then I just had to say again to my mum, you, you know, we do, I need, need some things to make. And I didn't really know. You know, you have to remember back in those days, I didn't even know what to do with you, sanitary pads. Where would I put them in? And they were so big in the bathroom. You know, we, we, I grew up in a tiny bungalow in the middle of nowhere in Cornwall. Where, where was I going to put this, you know, <laughs> stuff? It's just, I think for women of my generation, so I'm Generation X, it was, you know, you either had a family or a parent or a woman around you who was really going to tell you about it. And there were the kind of sort of old school hippies in the 70s who, you know, I'm a friend of mine, her mum had a party when she had her first period. So there were such varying ways of dealing with it. But societally, it was still, we were still shameful. I mean, there were no period ads on, on television until after the 80s. Um, you know, no one ever mentioned the word tampon. If you bought any sanitary products, which were then called, I think they were called feminine hygiene products, you you were given a brown paper bag to take them away in, in local shops. So if we didn't start in a good place, I don't think. And then obviously when I went on to edit Cosmopolitan and Elle and, and the big glossy magazines, I was very aware that even the most basic information, is it, it has to still be out there. We have to still tell people about it. And I was very aware of that when I've got three daughters and a son, that um, my daughters were incredibly well informed in a, in advance, probably too much so. And it was probably embarrassing for them. But that was the beginning of um, my period journey. But I do remember at 11 thinking, this doesn't feel, you know, right that <laughs> we're not all just talking about it's a bodily function, like a, another bodily function that, you know, a woman or a young girl is going through. So perhaps we need more information on that. And you didn't learn anything about it in, at school? We had um, PSHE, I think they call them uh, lessons. And well, they were intermittent. You either had PSHE or religious education. I could never work out why they were swappable um, as lessons. Um, but we we weren't really, as far as I can recall, and I might be misremembering, we weren't really given, you know, the basics of how, where do you go to buy uh, this? How much would it cost? You know, I went to school in a comprehensive and I 
looking back, I can imagine period poverty was a real thing for some of the girls in that Cornish comprehensive, you know, who were arriving at school, not well fed. So buying tampons, sanitary has probably would have been the last, but we were never told any of the practical. And I think also we were given the idea that, you know, we would, we would almost bleed to death every month. You know, it would be gushings of blood. We didn't, it wasn't till I was much older, sort of 16, 17, that I found out it's just a very small amount of blood you, you, you lose. And we certainly tied periods to, you know, being pregnant. There was that shame, massive fear and shame around getting pregnant um, as well, uh, That you know, as a teenage girl in the kind of um, more urban area. So it was a sort of, it was a strange time. I just, I don't remember the school being in any way helpful. I'm sure that might have been a one-off experience. Perhaps other schools were more helpful and, and girls had different experiences. You're definitely not alone. You know, the women that I've spoken to of your age on the podcast, you know, and in other areas have described similar experiences to yours. Um, and I wonder the shame And this lack of knowledge that you had about your period, how did that kind of tie into your experience of your period itself? Did you, you know, you had this experience where your mom wasn't very helpful and you had to kind of scrabble around your friends to figure out what to do. You weren't learning much at school. And then how was your actual period? Was it heavy? Was it painful? Well, it at the time, I think, I mean, I don't blame my mum. I think that boomer generation of women found it very difficult and they didn't know either. They hadn't got the information. So uh, I had um, very heavy periods and very irregular periods for the first year um, and really going on for the first sort of three years, which I don't think is abnormal for, you know, we, I present a podcast called um, Postcast Midlife and we had Maisie Hill from the Flow Collective on and she was talking about how teenage girls just don't understand their cycle and how it affects them, as I'm sure um, you know, Lenise. But I think I was confused as to, to to why it was so painful. I mean, I was in agony for some uh, four or five days and, it, you know, if I'd done it didn't luckily coincide with G- with O level exams or with things like that. But if I'd been in that place, I mean, certainly, you know, I did a lot of sport as a teenager, and it certainly prohibited me sometimes with sport as so well. I was just too, it was just too painful to to be running or playing netball or doing any of those things during that time. And I wish I'd known more about it. I'd wish I'd known that you know I could have gone to see a doctor about it and and perhaps found out a bit more about it and and looked at ways of alleviating it. Certainly with my daughters, the moment one of them has said, this is just unbearably painful, I've gone straight to the GP and said, can we we talk about why this might be painful for her and, and, you know, what are the options about making it easier for her? I think that's really interesting how you took a completely different approach with your doctors and you sorry your daughters and you said at the beginning you almost gave them a bit too much information which I think you know there's never a kind of too much when it comes to this sort of thing um but then kind of taking it to the other end in your book what's wrong with me you talk about your experience of perimenopause and how there's a line that I found really fascinating where you described your late 40s as constantly living in an escape room, looking for clues to the exit. Can you talk a little bit about how you navigated perimenopause and what you did to come out of the other side of it? Yeah, so um, perimenopause is the sort of 10 to 15 years before menopause. And menopause is 50 months the average age in this country, and it's the year after your last period. But in the time leading up to that, you have huge hormonal fluctuations, and there can be upwards of 40 symptoms of that. And it, uh, estrogen is in every part of your body. It's literally your petrol. Um, and when it disappears some months and comes back the next month, it causes all sorts of problems, particularly uh my symptoms were mainly sort of neurological symptoms. I had extreme anxiety and um, panic attacks and uh, night sweats and night terrors and just things that really had never been part of my life. There's no history of mental illness or depression in my family. I would I was extremely depressed. Um, I, I had no reason to be there was no evidence, you know, there was no history health wise for me to have that. And there was nothing in my life that would have that and there were just so many things coming together and I'm a journalist I was working 
um, towards the end of my career on airline at the beginning of my career on Sunday Times style. And I just started to look at what might be happening while I pretended everything was <laughs> kind of okay because women do and and you know it's why we set up the podcast we started to just find out more and more and eventually I saw a, a, an expert Dr Louise Newton who said yes this is the perimenopause you your fluctuating hormones so that the, the uh, it's progesterone testosterone and estrogen that fluctuate are affecting all parts of your body now it doesn't affect everyone in the same way and you know we've interviewed women in their 40s who say really I've been a bit hot at night and that's it but we've also interviewed women who uh, attempted to take their own life um, and that's come completely out of the blue and that's because of the way estrogen works in in the brain so yeah it was a real learning curve and and the other thing that happened to me which I actually wrote about um in the Sunday Times, which I think was a bit shocking at the time, it was about four years ago, was I, I had had, after my teenage years, I had sorted my periods out. They were very light. They were incredibly regular. I never had any pain. I had had, I had four children. I'd um, gone right the way through with really no significant gynecological problems. But around the age of, I had my last baby at 43, around the age of 47, 48, my periods were Armageddon-like. They were um, They were so heavy I would be concerned about going from the bathroom upstairs to the kitchen downstairs. They would, it was just, and I thought, well, perhaps I have some form of cervical cancer. Perhaps there is something really desperate. This is a really common symptom of perimenopause. Um, and it was, just, they were agonizing. I was spending days in bed with terrible headaches. And it was that really, that symptom that I went to the doctor because my actual physical day-to-day -day life was becoming quite difficult. I remember having a meeting in a, in a room, um, in one of my uh, jobs, and I couldn't leave the room until everyone else had left the room because the, the, the I had I flooded. So it was, I knew I was going to leave a mark on the chair. I knew it was going to be difficult. I knew it was also, it was sorting that out, but what I sort of look back and think now is why did I ignore that it was about a year that went on <laughs> and I thought well I mean you know I'll just sort of get you know wear tampons and a pad and wear this and do do you know and I'll just sort of plan my day around it so that I'm near the loo and all of that and I think and I talked to a lot of women for my uh, book you know because the tagline is 101 things midlife women should know and one of the things women should know is that's not normal you don't have to put up with that. You can go and talk to your doctor and, and hormone replacement therapy is what worked for me. I mean, within a month, my periods were absolutely back um, to normal. Um, and then I opted to, to not have periods. But it was, I really think women need to to not try and stuff, tough it out. You know, the Gen X is a real, you know, a lot of us, are, I think, have what they, they call, call burnout now. I think we worked really hard because we were so grateful for all of the opportunities we'd been given. And we, you know, we couldn't really talk about periods out loud anymore. People would come up to me as I went to the loo and say, oh, I've read your piece on periods and oh my goodness I'm going through that and I'd say well we should all be you know we hide our tampons when we walk to the toilet that's ridiculous you know we should be able to have a normal bodily function that's normal for anyone who you know is going through monthly changes it, it would it just felt I really feel that we need to talk about it a bit more and if I'd known that was coming um I was also severely anemic obviously because of this um which affected you know my my you know how I felt day to day I would be sitting down in the on the sofa and waking up four hours later because I was absolutely exhausted I had no iron I had a really low ferritin count <laughs> all these things that I just sort of put up with because I thought I don't want to make a fuss at the doctor and I'm sure it's perfectly normal and it you know <laughs> it's a funny generation we're a funny generation I'm really hoping that millennials and gen z don't that they really investigate their health as soon as it changes why do you think that is that gener generation X are very much about, you know, you just have to get on with it, you know, don't complain, just, you know, just put up with it and then maybe eventually you'll figure it out? Well, I think it is a massive generalization, but I think we work in a very patriarchal system. It's not set. It's not fit for purpose for women. It doesn't work for us. And we're trying to work within it as opposed to working or lean around it or, or maneuver ourselves. And, and actually, it just doesn't work for us. You know, there, there's there's just a better way of doing things where there would be more support for us um, for our kind of physical issues that we might um, go through. But I think we were also the have it all generation. We were really taught and I guess we absorbed it. A lot of us, I did certainly without really thinking it through you know we, we we made changes where we could and where our our kind of I mean I always work for male bosses even in a really female um 
you know, business like women's magazines, you know, the money was was controlled by men. I, we we asked sometimes for things that would make it better, but we didn't ask enough. And I guess we felt that we took have it all and we we decided that meant do it all. So we tried to be, you know, brilliant at home, brilliant at work. And, you know, I have to say men just didn't step up. They couldn't, they didn't do better, even where families where people were saying, you know, my husband's, you know, we have equal equal care, et cetera, et cetera. And that's all brilliant. But what there wasn't was equal thinking. So the emotional labor was still, you know, very much the the woman in the partnership thinking of all the things that had to be done today. Or, you know, sometimes I, I, I sort of joked with my friends that we would wake up once we had children while we were doing full-time jobs, we'd wake up and think, how can I keep everyone alive today? That was literally our first thought you know where are all the children how will they do this and you know we didn't sometimes we didn't help ourselves we didn't talk about paid child care that we were paying for that was invaluable we couldn't have done our jobs without it we didn't talk about how amazing our jobs were and how they made us feel brilliant and, and gave us a real sense of self-esteem and self-worth and really great role modeling for our daughters and our sons so it was maybe we were just sort of finding our way through but I think we had a real kind of you know we can do hard things tough it out attitude in general I interviewed nearly 100 women for the book and that was a very you know I I, I tried to pick women from all kinds of diverse black backgrounds and I interviewed black women and brown women as well and it, the theme was the same across every <laughs> everyone you know we we gonna have to get this done in this patriarchal system that doesn't quite work for us what are the some of the biggest differences that you see amongst millennial and Jed, Gen Z women? I think they are much kinder to themselves. They are much more informed. I mean, the brilliant women who set up all these kind of, particularly around uh, menstrual health, are beginning to set up brilliant businesses. There's, you know, We Are Flow. There's Bloody Good Period for Period Poverty. There's what Maisie Hill does. Um, there's all of this kind of work going on now. And so, and it's based, I think, a little bit in that kind of area of looking after yourself, being kinder to yourself. And and the medical profession has been largely unhelpful and unkind around women and their ability to endure pain. The thinking has been extraordinarily wrong. I was listening to a podcast yesterday as well, where, you know, women can get pregnant in a, in a 24 hour period within four weeks that's the only time a woman can get pregnant a man can make a woman pregnant every single day every single hour but it's our responsibility to take on birth control now that that's not fair you know and and birth control for a man is much easier sorted out than it is for a woman and it can sometimes take a year to get your birth control it's not fair you know vasectomies are still viewed as something quite unusual many women are very desperate after childbirth to to for their husband's partners to have vasectomies but that's still considered unusual you wouldn't dream of asking a man to do it. There's so many inequalities, but I think millennials and Gen Z are absolutely aware of that. And I think millennial and Gen Z men are aware of that and they're aware they need to do better and they will do better. Um, so I think the tide is beginning to turn. It's a glacial pace, unfortunately. And also it's just in built in our culture that that <laughs> we give men a break around this kind of stuff and we we really shouldn't, you know, and, and that we should be talking to our sons. You know, I asked my husband to talk to my daughters about uh, their periods uh, I didn't want it to just be me because I wanted my son to see that and I wanted my son to be in the room he's 16 now when this kind of thing was discussed because I think it's really important and actually you know to not have that shame or embarrassment or which my Gen Z daughters absolutely don't I mean they really don't have any shame or embarrassment around their periods they're very vocal about what they use and how they use it and you know whether the cut works and all of that we'll talk about that in front of everybody and I think that's a good thing yeah I I completely agree I want to just talk a little bit about you have a whole section in your book around rage and this kind of (laughs) midlife rage and I find it so fascinating because you know you talk about how women have been told for most of their life that showing their anger isn't ladylike. And I certainly, you know, remember conversations with my mom, even now where I will get angry about something and she would say, okay, calm down, calm down. And um, she's kind of cusp mid uh, kind of Gen X baby boomer and the anger showing anger is not, you know, the done thing. Um, But, you know, I feel very, you know, 
it feels very potent in a way when I am a, able to express my anger and rage sometimes because, you know, there are a lot of things in the world that can make you feel rage. I just want to kind of chat a little bit with you about that section in your book and what you would say to any woman who is listening and is struggling to express herself and this rage she might feel inside. Well, the rage is the, I would say, 100% common feeling across all uh, perimenopausal women, less so after menopause, I think. So from a physiological point of view, it's the the loss of estrogen and the fluctuations of the hormones. I mean, there's no one test for being in perimenopause because one day you have estrogen, the next day you don't. That's the fluctuating oil that causes the problem. But um, with Gen X, I think we'd also got to a point in our 40s where we just had enough and we just couldn't do the bending around people. You know, you get older, you're more experienced and you just think, do you know what, I'm not going to keep quiet in this meeting anymore. I'm going to ask that man not to speak over me again because it's impossible for me to get to the end of my sentence. So I'm going to say at the beginning, please don't talk over me while I'm, you know, so I I had reached a kind of point of (laughs) I'm just I'm not putting up with that anymore. And, you know, and you watch your your daughters sort of dealing with bits of it. And I just thought I'm not having her deal with it again. I just think this is really unfair. So I'm going to make it a point and we're going to talk about it. But the rage has a physical and emotional component. And it's it's absolutely it's really overpowering sometimes. You're absolutely physically furious. And I mean, I got really cross with, with I remember reversing the car into something and, and really losing my temper a lot. And that was, you know, when I went on hormone replacement therapy um, just before I was 50, that did ease the rage, but I didn't lose the fury. I was still quite cross about everything and I just decided to put it to a good use. But it was a shock for me because I had, you know, we had been told as a generation that, you know, that the language around women losing their temper is sh- shrill. Mm-hmm. You know, there's such awful negative derogatory language around any woman who is, is seen to be shouting or losing her temper or raising her voice or, you know, may, you know, we, you've got to remember we're a generation that really didn't see a female newsreader hardly ever. We didn't see women in any adverts about the men medical profession unless it was nurses and and also we saw nurses as you know it's sexy nurses and halloween costumes and things so our you know we have benny hill as part of our i mean you won't know that as an american it's just an abhorrent saturday night program and you know we had a lot of things where women were persistently and consistently demeaned and had to be quiet as well so for us it was a you know i think suddenly you just boil over and you just can't deal with it anymore certainly that's how i felt but It really just comes out of the blue, this rage, and it's really so common. I mean, Davina McCall wrote about it in her book. She talked about it on the um, programme that she made. Kate Neuer, the journalist who wrote a number one bestselling book, it's just she talks about it as well through, you know, how it just catches you by surprise and it's just there. But you can turn it to doing, you know, good things with it, I think, because it is a bit of a force of nature. But, you know, what I would say to women is, recognize it may come you know the whole point of us doing the podcast the whole point of me writing the book was for women in their sort of mid-30s through to recognize that these things might be coming I mean things that help with the rage are exercise absolutely um I'm was very anti-yoga I thought it was ridiculous and how could that possibly work actually that really helped taking that up really helped with the rage for me it really calmed me down I learned about breathing I found other places to put it so that it was perhaps a more positive than a negative emotion. So I would recognize it. I would sense it might be coming and not feel that you're alone or there's anything wrong with you or there's anything wrong in voicing what you feel about things. I think that's really important. And hopefully the millennial men and Jen and said men are less likely to talk over you in meetings. Mm. What's really interesting is that there is um, this great psychiatrist um, called Dr. Julie Holland, and she talks about estrogen as the hormone of accommodation. And yes, when you're kind of thinking about the menstrual cycle, at the end of your menstrual cycle, when estrogen is naturally declining and progesterone is naturally declining, you, some women do experience this kind of anger or this kind of more forthrightness. And that can be described as being kind of moody or, you know, shrill. But it's interesting when you remove estrogen 
and you kind of more willing to speak your mind and say what you really think. And I know it's different in perimenopause, but it does feel like a version of that. And it gets smeared, you know, oh, she's moody, she's being bitchy. When actually, you know, women are just more likely to speak their mind during that time of their menstrual cycle, which I find really fascinating. And when you talk about it, you see you see women starting to connect the dots in their mind and, oh, actually, that that's probably what's going on for me. Yeah, I think the key, isn't it, as you always say, and, and when you came on the podcast, is to recognize what's going on. Yeah. Work out how you deal with it yourself. Yeah. And in... In your book, you talk a lot about changes in identity and, you know, navigating your 40s where you get to a point where you almost feel like, you know, okay, I've got everything sorted. You know, even though you've got kids and they're constantly changing, um, but you kind of feel your work, work is sorted, you know what you're doing. And then you're hit with all of these physical and emotional changes, which you know, as you described in your book, can can kind of change the way that you you view yourself. And, you know, you describe in your book this, you use this, you say this line where you had this sense of feeling like you didn't belong here in this space and time. And I feel like that will be a lot something that a lot of women in this phase of life will connect with. Can you talk a little bit more about this? Yes, because it's something I explored uh, quite deeply because I had written a parenting book about parenting teenagers, teenage girls. And during my research for that, I'd learned that the teenage brain from the age of 12 to 25 is basically dismantled and, and put back together again um, from a neurological point of view. But while that's happening, you're building the thing that's the most important thing you'll ever have, and that's your identity. It's core to your day-to-day life, how you you react, how you behave. It so much influences, but it's really what you hold on to and keeps you strong through everything, your identity. So when you get to your 40s, the immense amount of change is like an earthquake for your identity. Again, the estrogen affects the brain. But other than that, other things are happening. You are losing people. People are dying around you. It's, you know, you, you lose friends. You you see terrible things. Um, your parents are elderly. They need something else um, from you. You know, at, you're, you're parenting them in a way that you weren't before. Your children leave home. So I think empty nest syndrome, my eldest left home uh, three years ago. And I had thought people were making a bit of a fuss about it. And if this is surely this was the point. We got them ready. They went out. How amazing and exciting. It was I was grief stricken. It, it took me out. It was really just the worst feeling. We we had a family unit and suddenly it was a totally different family unit. Overnight, it was a totally different family unit. So our day to day behavior changed. So there was so much change. I started to one, you know, who who was I within that change? And I think. The other thing that's core to identity, I think, is if you're lucky enough to be able to have children. And also, even if, you, if you're if you not, your journey to through motherhood, trying to be a mum, failing to be a mum, not failing, but not being able to be a mum, all of that suddenly comes into view. It's like it's sort of presented to you in front of you and you start to kind of examine it. It's a very emotional time. And you think, well, where do I belong? Do I belong to... I don't belong to the women mothering younger children anymore. I don't belong to people who go home to their parents so that their parents can look after them anymore because I'm having to look after my parents. You know, you just don't belong in any kind of tribe anymore. You don't fit anywhere. And it's a little bit of a lonely feeling because we haven't talked about this before. Everyone assumes they're going through it on their own and there's not. There's like an army of women going through it all at the same time. And we need to use those women um, a bit bit more. And I think this sense of not belonging really undermines you. It's very upsetting. It's a real shake of, um, it makes you lonely. It makes you sad. Um, The thing is, what you're doing is entering what they what therapists call the liminal void. You're entering this immense amount of change and you sort of have to sit with that pain for a bit. And when you come out the other side, you think, 
actually, do you know what? This is who I am now. This is who I want to be. And in a way, what's brilliant about it, because I don't want to frighten women going into this phase, because the more you know, the, the more wonderful it is. When you come out the other side, you can form your identity. You can choose. As a teenager, you don't really have a lot of choice. It's sort of based on context and learning and, you know, what will you be as an adult? Whereas now you are an adult, you have a bank of experience. You can choose how you want to be. Do I want to be that hard unbending person anymore do I want to be that kind of person that can't say no that doesn't set any boundaries anymore or can I just choose to be this now and you you, you do have to sit in the middle bit a little bit and the, the void as I call it in the book feeling the the pain of the departure of the other bits of you and the kind of sense of questioning who you would be but you're hope filled and then you choose what you want to be um, and I think that works you know, for every situation, I, d- I don't think that's just, you know, me speaking from a fairly privileged white point of view. I think, um, you know, we don't know everyone's stories and, and what they've been through. But I think most of us can start thinking about choosing as women who we want to be. Mm. I think that's really powerful because I definitely see women, certainly in their 50s, my friends who are in their 50s and 60s, they do have this potency about them. And I absolutely love being able to speak to them and tap into their experiences. And actually, you gave a really interesting example um, of the book where one of your friends, she had had her her own business. She was very successful. And then she decided to wind down that business. And she almost lived, she said she lived like her teenage son did for a year where she just kind of took that time to figure out who she was and then decided to step into something else that became ultimately quite successful (laughs) as well. (laughs) Uh, But I just thought that was, you know, that was quite fascinating. And just kind of tying into what you said earlier about, you know, the experience of this time in other cultures and other ethnicities where there is this kind of different view of women who are in this phase of life and who have gone through, who are postmenopausal, where there's they're more revered, they're more respected. Um, what do you think that we need to do in the UK to get to that place, just for women who are kind of postmenopausal to be viewed differently. We do live in a really ageist society, unfortunately, and and very bizarrely, you know, youth is still tied to our fertility. The idea of you know how fertile we are, and the moment we're not fertile, we're not useful, and it's such a patriarchal bizarre thing that's still going on it's a huge set of messages that are all manner of wrong um for women but as you say in other many other cultures japan places like that there are words for menopausal women which are you know leader powerful but it's a very different you step into a whole different place and actually it has been shown in some studies that there are less symptoms associated with perimenopause and menopause because women approach it in such a positive way because society's behind them and encouraging them and saying this is your these are the glory days they're coming it's going to be amazing and we all respect you for it whereas here it's this we don't see women culturally over 40 it portrayed often in a positive manner it's starting to happen but you know if you look at tv if you look at songs if you look at presenters and all that kind of thing it's all younger is seen as better or the language is is still that so we just we need to gradually start changing that and what I I mean by that I don't mean that you know we all have to be J-Lo at 55 you know opening the Super Bowl on a pole upside down and amazing for her to do that but she worked that's her job she works incredibly hard to do that and she does it in her way but you know there's a million ways we need to see more women staying longer in in jobs you know we need them in schools staying longer in their jobs so that young women can see that that's potentially you can do that forever or we need to hear of women stepping out of jobs and doing different things and finding who they are and, and working in a in a different way so it's just really gradually talking about it I think out loud and um making sure that we don't associate aging with bad things 
Um, the, you know, there's a lot of debate around at the moment around midlife and all this talk of menopause and perimenopause and we're frightening younger women and we shouldn't be putting this information out there, which is ridiculous. Or, you know, if we don't, that's like a very male attitude to, to keep stop women talking about things because we don't want to hear from them. Um, I think the idea is we put it out there. We say, this is all the information. This is where you get the support. Be ready for it. And then you're not going to hit 43, 44 you know, go through what I went through at that age, which was a real shock and, and very unsupportive. And I think we need the health, you know, we need the medical profession to back up around us, actually. You know, the, the reason hormone replacement therapy is not as widely used as it was is a, a terribly misleading survey done 20 years ago, which has been repeatedly discredited for all its findings. Um, and that influenced a huge amount of women. But, you know, it works for me. It doesn't work for everybody, hormone replacement therapy, but it's literally not offered. Two thirds of GPs, prescribe antidepressants instead of HRT and antidepressants while they may work for some just keep an army of women in a zombie-like place and it really doesn't solve the actual physical problem and you know in other cultures you know black and brown women are not listened to in the same way that white women are with by the medical profession so their journey through menopause and perimenopause is even more difficult I mean we all we all know that (laughs) We're consistently ignored by the medical profession anyway. We had a, a, an esteemed cancer doctor, uh, Professor Michael Baum, on our podcast, and he said that in the early days in his career, he would go around the wards uh, where there were women being treated for cancer and turn up their morphine drips because they were on much lower doses than men being treated for cancer. So it's literally endemic in the medical profession, and I think that will start to come out to not you know, treat women with the support that they need. So all of that sort of needs to start happening around us, but just ourselves. We just need to be really careful of the language we use around our daughters and our our younger people around us. You know, it is impossible for a woman of Gen X to talk about her size without saying how fat she is and without using the fat word. It's just, we just can't do it. And it's a terrible thing. We we look in the mirror and we say how disappointed we are. We, We are naked. I mean, I do a lot of open water swimming, so I'm in the swimming costume a lot and I'm changing by the side of lakes and pools with loads of women of all different shapes and sizes. And I just wish the attitude there where we really don't care was an attitude we could take into fancy gyms it was an attitude we could take into school changing rooms it's you know to not be critical of ourselves to not you know if we think it just don't say it out loud you know don't use words that refer to us as old don't keep talking about you know that senior moments and all of that those are little ways we can stop you know degrading ourselves really um around getting older and talk about how amazing it is because it is really amazing i you know to feel this less vulnerable to have really good boundaries around what I will and won't do and, to, and how I will and won't let people talk to me or deal with me is, is really powerful and really helpful you know some women choose to do all sorts of things around looking um better at this age and that's great for them some women don't but if you don't don't talk about wrinkles as bad things don't talk about it's the language I think is really important I completely agree I think that I I feel really positively about, you know, perimenopause and menopause being discussed more. But something I find a bit worrying is how much negativity is part of these conversations and how when we you seem to have you have conversations about perimenopause and menopause in the press, it's very much alongside all of the negative symptoms, hot flashes, hot night sweats, brain fog, the senior moment that you mentioned. And I would love to have more of this, you know, and you will have more of a sense of yourself and you will have more of a sense of what your boundaries are, knowing that you can say no, that no is a complete sentence, knowing it's okay to not say yes to everything. I would love to see more of that because you know as you say when a young woman reads about you know this time of life it can feel quite quite negative yeah what would you say to someone who is in their 20s and 30s and you know this isn't really on their radar but it is something that should be because what you do in your 20s and your 30s will have an effect of your experience of your 40s and your 50s what would you say to them? What do you think they really need to know? Well, I mean, I just, I don't think young women want to hear menopause and perimenopause. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I wouldn't have done. I just would have thought it's just so far away. It's so, it's like when you're, 
11 and someone talks to you about when you're 15, you just can't imagine it. It's, an, it's a whole different world. Um, but what I would say generally is to get to know about your physical health. We had Dame Leslie Regan on, who's who's kind of the most senior gynecologist in the country. She's the chair of Wellbeing of Women. And she has studied this for her whole career. And she said, tying up what you go through as a teenager to, you know, this kind of joining the dots all the way through your life is really, really important. So be absolutely clear on your health from the age of 18 onwards. You know, think when you go to the GP and ask about, um, you know, what whether you're going to go on the pill or what all of these things, get the information, say, will this affect me in five years time? Will it affect me in 10 years time? How will this play out when I'm older? What am I going through now that may be relevant to what I will go through when I hit 40, when it all changes? Because it's such a massive physiological change for women. There's so many big studies being done around it at the moment because heart disease is the biggest killer of women. Dementia is a big killer of women. All of these things start to become relevant when you're 40. So what can you do in the lead up to that that will help towards that? Obviously, we know, and we've chatted about this, Liz, haven't we, the lifestyle changes are really important. You know, alcohol, whether you exercise or not, the kind of exercise you do, what's right for your body, what's not right for your body. Really get to know yourself and don't see that as self-indulgent or, you know, being obsessed about your health. Really do properly get to know. That's what I would I say to my daughters. What's going on here every month? You know, how are you feeling? And I think all of these are markers for things that could happen or be relevant as you get older. We we absolutely know gut health is just probably the most important. The gut brain access, unquestionable. We know that from all the evidence now. So nutrition is really important. But this is not about denial. This is about adding in, not taking out. We really know about movement. We know that that's incredibly important. So this is not about doing triathlons. This is about 30 minutes outside. We know nature helps. We know vitamin D deficiency is really problematic. So I think all of that, doing a constant review of your health and what you might be missing and what you might need to add in is is really good. And also, you know, the biggest, biggest killer of women and, well, not physical killer, but the biggest, um, we we had a... a doctor on who'd done massive studies into longevity. The one thing that keeps you living longer is social interaction. So loneliness is a killer. I mean, it really is. It's more harmful than and this is from various books that we've had and, and scientists we've had on the, our podcast. And I'm not saying this off the top of my head. It's absolutely true. It's scientifically program uh, proven isolation and loneliness are killers so Mm. keep your social connections really do keep them keep the good people around you and particularly in midlife you are going to need to soften you're going to need to ask for help you're going to need to be vulnerable so whatever your background and wherever you're from it's not a gen x thing to ask for help i think it might be more of a millennial thing hopefully fingers crossed um but that keeping that connection being members of clubs, doing things in teams, working in teams, it's really, really important. It's vital. It reduces stress levels. And we know stress is a really big cause of inflammation. So reducing that stress level, even if it's just tiny things every day, a 10 minute phone call, all of these things are good prescriptions. That social prescription, I think, for women is really important. And I loved the chapter in your book where you talk about friendship. I thought that was really powerful because that's kind of something I'm thinking a lot at, about at the moment. Because, you know, you get to a point in your life where you you are so busy and you're just focusing on how can I get through this day? How can I get through this week? And certain people can fall off the wayside, by the wayside. And, you know, you said, you know, if you haven't spoken to someone in a while, just, you know, just check in, you know, because they might be thinking of you just as much as you're thinking as well of them as well. And that boost that you get from connecting with someone is just it's so it makes you feel so much better on so many different levels. So yeah, really, really powerful. Super important, super, super important. More than you know, drinking a pint of water a day or deciding to be teetotal. It's is more important than that. Yeah, definitely. You've shared so much, and I know that listeners will get so much from your book. So it's what's wrong with me? One hundred and one things midlife women need to know. 
and it will be available on the 25th of May. Yeah, pre-order now. Apparently pre-order is r- really helpful for um but the money doesn't go out until the book's posted, so. Yeah. What's the one thing that you want to leave listeners with? I think whatever age you are, check in every morning and ask yourself the questions. Do I want to do this? Is it serving me well? How am I really feeling? Because we get wrapped up in wellness and we think, oh, well, wellness means we must do this. And we do. Wellness is how am I really feeling and what things could I do to make me feel better? And also, it's okay to feel sad. It's really okay. It's not a big problem. <laughs> Sit in that space sometimes, feel the pain of it and come out the other side. It's not, you're never going to be happy all the time. It's impossible. So big accept that. And I think that's that's the main thing, just constantly checking in with yourself on what's working and what's not working. Fantastic. Where can listeners find you? Well, um, I co-host a podcast called Postcards from Midlife with Trish Halpern, where we interview, I mean, we've had everyone from Elizabeth Hurley, Claudia Winkleman, Davina, and all really big experts um, about midlife. So, um, and that's for all all women. We have really interesting women on. Um, I'm on Instagram at Lorraine Candy. I'm pretty active there. Um, and that's it, really. Yeah, I think that's, that's it. I'm a podcaster. We have a... A live show, two day live festival in May on the 19th and 20th, where all the experts that we've had on the show and all the many of the celebrities will be there. So we're going to get all the midlife women and their friends in one place in Islington in London at the Business Design Centre. That's postcards from midlife um, dot co dot UK. You can get tickets there. So, yeah, we'll be presenting there and hopefully gathering lots of information so that we can share that with other midlife women. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. For more inspiring conversations, head over to periodstorypod.com where we have so many more for you to peruse. If you want help with your menstrual or hormone health, email me on hello at eatlovemove.com to set up a free 30-minute hormone health review. If you like today's show, please don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. Tag us, come say hi, and send in your requests for who you'd like to see on the show on Instagram and Twitter on at periodstorypod or email us at hello at periodstorypod.com. I'm Lenise Brothers, and you've been listening to Period Story. Thank you so much for listening.